The title of my sermon this morning is Lord of the Fish. You've heard of Lord of the Flies? Today, Lord of the Fish. And what I want us to look at is answering the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Because at Grace City Church, we say it like this. We exist as a church family to help more people, say it with me, meet, love, follow Jesus Christ, period. That's why we're here. That's where we're going. That's why we give, serve, pray, gather. We believe God has called us to be a part of his mission, and that in doing so, we're now coming alive, that in coming in line with the maker creator's purpose for our life, we are increasingly beginning to live our life for the very reason we were put here. So we don't just do church to do church. We have something we're going after, namely to help more people meet and love follow Jesus. We say it this way because we think the end game is following Jesus, but you won't follow someone you don't love. At least you shouldn't. That's religion. You won't follow someone you don't love, and you can't love someone you haven't met. Therefore, we need to be about helping more people meet the one true Jesus because working front to back, we believe to meet the true Jesus is to love him. Now, there's false ideas of Jesus and misunderstandings of Jesus and bad representations of Jesus, but when you meet and encounter the true living God, the only response is is to love him. Oh, my goodness! And then to follow him out of that love. And so if following Jesus is the end game, it's fair for us from time to time to ask, what does it look like to follow Jesus? What does that mean? How do we know if we're doing it right? And this message isn't just for those who aren't familiar with Jesus or new to church. This message is for those of us who've been in church a while, doing this thing a while. Because what you and I can do is get busy with life. And when we get busy with life, the calling of God gets fuzzy. Busyness often equals fuzziness, right? And so we need regular, you know, okay, yeah, right, that's what I'm supposed to be about. Thank you. And one of the reasons I get up and preach every week is not because I think you need it so much as I know I need it. I couldn't go three, four, five, six weeks on my own. I would be so far out in the pawpaw patch, I couldn't even hear Jesus, let alone follow him. I need the regular word of God in my life. I need to be around people who are digesting the word of God, processing the word of God, and pouring the word of God into my life. I can't go hours, days, weeks, months without hearing the voice of God. I gotta be around the proclamation of the word. And so following Jesus is a good question to ask because sometimes we get fuzzy on it. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Here's what's cool about this story in Luke chapter 5. It's going to be the story, this whole passage is, is, is if you're new to the Bible, it's, it's famous for, it's called the calling passages where Jesus is going and calling his disciples. So if you're new to the story, Jesus comes via virgin birth, claims to be God, is now preaching and teaching the good news that the kingdom has come through his arrival and now he's going to go call some followers. Disciple simply means learner. He's going to call the fo- people to follow him, and this is the first account of that, which means Peter is, is the first disciple to be called. And we're going to see Peter becomes kind of a prototypical disciple, in that while he was an exceptional disciple in what God did through him, he's not an exception to what, how God wants to use all of us. I mean, how God interacts with Peter and what goes on there, I believe is prototypical for us to learn from for all disciples everywhere for all time. God hasn't changed working. What he does now is, 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 is how he worked then. And so this is an example for us, for us to look to. So if you've got your Bibles, hope you do. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Here's the story. Let's get out in front of us, and then let's see what we can learn from it. And for those of you who've never heard this, this would be kind of a fun story. For those of you who've heard it a hundred times, let me encourage you. I saw things this week I've never before connected dots in this passage this morning. So thankful that late... The word of God is layered so that we can dig and dig and even continue to see new things. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Galilee, is another name for it, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats boats so full 
that they began to sink. So much detail that gives the story color. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Or in Matthew, from now on, I will make you fishers of men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. In this passage, I believe we see a picture of what it looks like to follow Jesus. So we're asking the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And here's how I'm going to frame it. A follower of Jesus is, and I'm going to use present tense active verb, because it's not as if you do these things one time and then move on. This is, this is the regular, ongoing process of one who is following Jesus, because following Jesus is not so much about, about arriving at a destination so much as it is following him on a journey. And it's good to remember because some of us get discouraged, weary, worn out because we fail, we mess up, we screw up, we forget, we, we, we get anxious and fearful, and Jesus comes and says, like, that's okay, we still got a long road ahead, let's just keep going. And so following Jesus is not a static event. I'm here. Following Jesus is an ongoing, active, present tense event where we're daily, moment by moment, following Jesus. And so what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Number one, a follower of Jesus is listening to Jesus. Listening to Jesus. Look at the text. Chapter 5, verse 1. On one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of, of Galilee, the people were crowded around him and listening to the word of God. Here's what I want to say. Following Jesus is much more than just listening to Jesus, but it's not less than listening to Jesus. Meaning there's more to following Jesus than just listening to Jesus, but following Jesus is not any less than listening to Jesus. Because you can't follow Jesus if you're not listening to him. Paul put it this way, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing from the word of God. And here's what I want you to consider. How many voices are vying for your attention today? If you just begin listing a list of potential voices you could pay attention to, how many could you write down? Friends, relatives, coworkers, news feeds, news channels, news outlets, social media, probably the worst one, the voice in my head. Of all the people you should listen to, you are the last. <laughs> one honest sister, that's right. She's like, dear Lord, don't, help, don't let Josh listen to Josh. <laughs> Think about it this way. I said a few weeks ago, if you're having a conversation in the second person in your head, it might be because a demon's talking to you. You're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not worthy, you know what you've done, you know who you are, you know who you aren't, you know what nobody else does, you're not loved, people are talking about you, people don't respect you, and, and who is that? That's not the voice of the Father. And unless you're mentally ill, you shouldn't be talking to yourself in a second person. It might be the voice of the enemy, whose name is also the accuser. So the first step to following Jesus is someone who is actively, in an ongoing way, listening to Jesus. Another way to say it, a follower of Jesus is someone who is continually filtering who or what they're listening to. And constantly asking the question, from where is this voice coming Recently, I was, I was, I was sick in, 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 in March, got really sick, pneumonia, and, and, and was down for three weeks, and, and like, man, like, like asking Jesus to take me home, sharing the kids would be fine kind of sick. You know what I mean? Just like, bah, you know, and, and, I'm, on, and, and I'm, I'm sick, and in bed, I'm like, okay, Lord, let's, let, let's do something here. Let's make this worth our while. While I'm here, if I'm going to be here, at least say something to me. And I had just a clear impression that if you want to hear me talk, you gotta stop listening to other sounds. So I turned my phone off, no text, no email, no social media, no Facebook, no Netflix, no movies. I did not talk to another soul whose last name was not McPherson for almost three weeks. And you know what I found in those three weeks? Shocker. I began to hear the voice of God again. And this was my question, this was my repeated mantra. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, Father, speak, I'm listening. Father, would you speak to me, I'm listening. Father, would you speak to me, I'm listening. Father, would you speak to me, I'm listening. 
I found it would be in the first thing I'd say, I'd say in the morning, and I, I was just saying it throughout the day, Lord, if you want to speak, I'm listening. If you want to speak, I'm listening. Father, speak to me, Lord, I'm listening. That just became my prayer. 86 pages of journal entries later. I was like, oh, wow. And here's what I, I, I heard the Lord say to me as clear as I'm standing here today, as I was saying, Lord, speak to me, I'm listening. Lord, speak to me, I'm listening. Lord, speak to me, I'm listening. Here's what the Lord said to me. Josh, I need you to set aside more time for me to speak to you. And I was like, hmm, that's pretty good. <laughs> I was hoping like, you know, vision, direction, whatever. He's like, he's like, yeah, no, my answer to your request for me to speak to you is for me to tell you, you need to make more time for me to speak to you. And how many of us, the Lord would come alongside and say, I love you, I'm for you, I wanna talk to you if you'd listen, because typically when we're not hearing from God, it's not he's having a speaking, stuttering problem, it's that we're having a listening problem. And so the question I wanna put on the table then is, well how do we discern the call of God? Because I hear it all the time as a pastor, like, it's like, is God calling me to do this? Is God calling me to do that? What is this call of God? What is God's will for my life? And I'm not, I understand the question, and it's real, and I wrestle with it too, but where is God's will for my life might not be framing the question right because it implies that God's will is hidden. It implies that God is hiding his will like an Easter egg and you're out trying to find it and he's like, warmer, warmer, cold, cold, loser. Warmer, warmer, hot, hot, hot. hot. Ah, it's right there, stupid. You know, it's, it's like, that's like the picture we get when it's like, what is God's will for my life? And it's, it's, it's much less mysterious than that. And so I wanna, I wanna kind of, demystify this question of what's God's will for my life for us. If you're a new believer, a long-time believer, an unbeliever, if you're sitting in the, you know, you're like you're 12, 13, 14, you're like, what's God's will for my life? It's actually much simpler than you might think, and let's take a look at it. a few things we learn here. How to discern God's call on your life. Number one, understand it will be clear. It will be clear. In nowhere in this story where Jesus issues a call to the prototypical disciple in Peter was it unclear. In fact, one of the misnomers is it's this picture of, oh, Peter never met Jesus. Jesus comes along, gives him that stern, godlike look, and Peter follows him. Peter had known Jesus for a while. He'd been listening to Jesus for a while. He'd had him in his home. He healed his mother-in-law. He's been listening to him teach. Peter has been listening to Jesus, and now this will become a defining moment because he'll turn that listening into obeying, but it started with listening. And what I want you to hear is God's call in your life will always be clear. If it's not clear, and this might overstep my bounds here, but I want to say this carefully. If it's not clear, it might not be that big a deal. I th and I say that because I think sometimes we stress out about things that maybe we don't need to stress out about. Should I do this or not, God? What's your will? He might be going, well, can if you want. Can't, I don't, I don't. What do you think? What, what do you want to do? You know, where should I go for a job? He might be like, wherever you want to go. But I have a book that's very clear about how to live once you get there. Where should I live? I don't know, but here's how you should live when you get there. Where should I work? I don't know, but here's how you should work when you work there. And sometimes I think we make more mysterious and cloudy things that are actually quite clear. The fact of the matter is that Jesus did not confuse Peter with the call. It was very clear. Push the boat out, cast the net, follow me. Secondly, how to discern God's call, it will be progressive. It will be progressive. Jesus did not say, follow me, take notes, learn from me from three years, repeatedly mess up, abandon me in the garden, come back, watch me crucified, I'll reinstate you later, then go preach the gospel, explode the church, start the church, I'll build, you, I'll build the church on you as a foundation and you'll get crucified upside down for it, are you in? He was like, hey Peter, throw your nuts out on the other side of the boat. God's call will be progressive. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, the psalmist writes, not a halogen out in front of my life. Meaning what you don't necessarily always need is, a, is this halogen going, there's the next 17 steps of your life. What God gives you is the next step for your life. Expect it to be progressive. When you look at Peter's life, you look at the things Jesus told to him, it was progressively greater steps of faith. In this story, it's, hey Peter, 
push your, your boat out in the water and throw your nets off the side of the boat. But in a few chapters, it'll be, hey, Peter, in the midst of the storm, step out of the boat and come to me. It's progressive. Which means you need to obey what you know. When we obey the light that we have, more light is sure to come. Proverbs 4.18 says, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining even ever brighter till the full light of day. What's he saying? For those of you who get up before the sun comes up, I don't know, I don't understand that, but you, you know, you know I, I do it when I go hunting because that makes sense. <laughs> Anyways, you're up, it's dark, and then it begins to dawn, right? And you can't see things, and, and it, things are shapeless, and, and then like, oh, shapes start to come alive, and then pretty soon those shapes have, ha, have more shape and, and, and more outline, and then, and then at some point in time, it's like color enters the world, and you can make out color and details, and pretty soon that shape or a blob becomes a tree, and pretty soon that tree is green, and pretty soon that, that green tree has leaves, and pretty soon you can see the finest details on the leaves because Revelation is progressive, just like the dawn of the morning. So God's call will be, will be clear, it'll be progressive, and it will be doable. It may not be easy, but it will be doable. I love in this story, Jesus wasn't like, Peter, follow me, and call down fish from the sky. He was like, hey Peter, toss your net outside the boat. It might not be easy, it might not make sense, but it will be doable. Can I come over to your house? Can I heal your mother-in-law? Are you sure? No, just kidding. Push the boat out in the water? A little joke there, you'll get it on the way home. Anyways, uh. <laughs> that was funny. Push the boat out in the water? Push your net out in the water? All these things, while they might not have been rational, they were doable. And I say that because sometimes we tend to think like, oh, I don't know if I want to respond to the call of God because he's going to make me move to Zimbabwe and translate Leviticus <laughs> and eat bugs while they're alive, screaming for their life, guts oozing down my chin with tribal people chanting around the fire, I can't do it, Lord, I can't do it. It's like, dude, relax. Stop sleeping with your girlfriend. Right? Stop looking at porn. Stop cheating on your taxes. Stop being a jerk at work. Stop being fearful and anxious of tomorrow. Just, just do the small things here, bro. Don't make an excuse for not following Jesus because you're afraid of some huge step he might ask you to take when right now all he's asking you is to listen. And I think sometimes we have this misnomer like, well, if I give my life to God, he's going to ask me to do something I, I won't want to do. Never happened in the history of following Jesus. Happens a lot in religion. We'll get to it a moment later. It'll be doable. I want us to understand that because I, I don't want us to mystify the will of God. Sometimes it's much simpler than we think. Hey, listen to me, trust me, act. Number two, a follower of Jesus is listening Secondly, a follower of Jesus is trusting Jesus' word. Look at chapter five, verse four. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in a deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. What's the implication? No offense, I fish, you make cabinets. Right? Now, it's ridiculous when we hear Peter say that. You ever said that? No offense, Lord. I'm a farmer. I'm a dentist. I'm a single mom. I'm a whatever. You're only God of the universe. Right, 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 right. It sounds dumb using as I say it. Which I think is what happened to Peter. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. <clears throat> right but because you say so, I'll let down my nets. I love that. What's the mark of a follower of Jesus? They're listening to Jesus, 
But remember what I said, it's never enough simply to listen to Jesus. It's not any less, but it's not just listening to Jesus. It's then obeying Jesus. Faith is obedience. Faith is action. And Peter's response is so helpful for us. He's essentially saying, paraphrase coming, Jesus, what you're asking isn't hard, but it makes no sense. But because you asked me, I'll do it. There it is. My friends aren't doing it. The culture's not doing it. It wouldn't be recommended by my accountant. I've never seen anybody else do it. No one else on my team is talking like this. I'm not sure if I feel like doing it right now, but because you said so, I'll do it. Here's what I want you to consider, friend. Do you obey Jesus or just occasionally take his advice? Because if you're just occasionally taking his advice, you're not actually obeying him, you're just agreeing with him if, when, through your assessment, what he says is good for you. Meaning, you're not following Jesus, you're using him. And you've made a judgment call, and the judgment call is, I know better how to run my life than the maker and giver of life knows how to lead my life. Which for those of you who think Christianity is this massive blind leap of faith are hopefully seeing that it's the most logical thing you could do. To give your life to following the one who gave you your life. This is an illogical, irrational faith. This is the most logical thing you can do when speaking to the God of the universe. Just because you obey him occasionally doesn't mean that you are actually obeying him fully. Proverbs 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on what? Your own understanding. How many of you, by a show of hands and be honest, either did lean on or were tempted to lean on your own understanding this week? Put your hand up. Hold it up to make sure there's no liars in the room. Let's go, Jake. Okay, okay, good. You put your hand down. That's happening every week. Followers of Jesus listen to Jesus, and then they go, okay, wait. So if you want to know God's plan for tomorrow, make it your priority to obey God's calling and plan today. Or another way to say it, if you haven't let down your nets, don't leave your boat. Here's what I mean by that. Sometimes we think Christianity is, 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 is one or two huge leaps of faith in our life, when in reality it's a journey step by step every day. Jesus didn't show up, hey Pete, I'm Jesus, I know you don't know me, why don't you leave everything and follow me? And because he had that stern, godlike look, Peter did. No, Peter had a relationship with Jesus, he'd been listening to Jesus, observing Jesus, and now he's making a call. I think this guy's got something that nobody else has got. I'm gonna do what he says, and what he said was push the boat out, throw the nets over, and and, and whoa. Small steps of obedience. And here's an example. Some people think, I'll be generous when I make a ton of money, but right now, I gotta look out for number one. Newsflash, if you're not generous with a little, you will not be generous with much. What money does is reveal who you are, not make you better than you are. And so if you're stingy with a little, guess what you'll be with a lot? Stingy. If you're jealous because of how little you have, guess what you'll be when you have a lot? Jealous of what the other guy has. And so on and so forth. Don't equate Christianity with, with, with leaving the boat. Equate Christianity with obeying Jesus in the small things of life in the in and out journey of everyday life. Followers of Jesus listen to Jesus, they trust Jesus enough to obey him, and a follower of Jesus is then repenting of their sin. Look at this, I love this, verse six. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Here's the picture I love, the the, the detail of the story. Don't miss it because you're familiar with it. They're out fishing all night, 
no fish, no not a nothing, no fish for you. Jesus says, go out into the deep. And they're like, Lord, here's the deal. We know you're a carpenter. Let me explain how this works. You don't fish in the, you know, in the deep during the day. You fish in the shallows at night. But because you said so, we'll do it. They go out, whoa, fish, and they're there. And it, when, when you first read this, you're like, oh, they had a signal to each other. Like, what was the signal of the other boat, right? I think here was the signal. We're drowning over here. We need some help. <laughs> you know? And all of a sudden, they come over, and 27 foot, you know, foot long boats and eight foot wide boats are now filled to the gunwells with fish, and they're sinking. And I bet in that moment, they're like, oh, we're sinking. Oh, we're sinking. We're sinking. Row. I can't row. There's so many fish I can't row. This is awesome. This is terrifying. Whoa. I mean, all the emotions, right? We're set for life. Retirement. I'll never fish another day in my life if I make the shore and live past today. I mean, there's so much going on in this moment, right? I mean, how many times have they fished and caught nothing or fished and caught a few and now going against all instinct and all fishermen principles, they go out and it is literally boatloads of fish. And if I'm Peter, I'm like, woohoo! I knew that was going to happen. I was Jesus, of course. I was with him all the way. I'd be like, oh, this is crazy. But what happens? Peter gets in shore, looks at Jesus, and says, Father, apart from me, I'm a sinful man. What a strange response. Why did that happen? Because in that moment, Peter saw Jesus for who he was, namely, other. This wasn't Jesus' teacher. This wasn't Jesus, you know, carpenter. This was Jesus, Lord of the fish. And in seeing Jesus as holy, Peter's response was terrifying. He's holy, I'm not. In the first response, you look at Isaiah, you look at Job, you look at Moses, and now Peter, okay, uh, my bad. I am not worthy of being around you. Not because you're powerful, but because you're holy. And this is what I love. Peter's thought was, you know what? I get it now, not just a good teacher, a son of God. We probably shouldn't hang out much anymore because I'm a loser. And Jesus is going to say, oh, that's funny. I was just going to ask you to come follow me. <laughs> because the prerequisite to following Jesus is acknowledging your own inadequacy. If you show up at Jesus, see how I cast that net over the boat there? Still haven't got the picture here, bro. Here's the picture, and I love, I love all the Marvel movies coming out, you know, the Marvel Universe, and it's incredible, and 21, 22 movies now, the super, superhero universe is getting created, so fun, so full of biblical theology and redemptive storylines, it's just amazing. But here's what I love in comparison, Marvel comic universe to Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Master, Jesus the Lord. This is not superhero Jesus, okay? Here's what I mean by that. Whenever you watch a superhero movie, whenever there's that moment they gotta engage their superpowers, what happens? And I, I'm not making, I, I like the movies, they're great, great storytelling. What happens? It's one of these. Incoming, you know, nuclear missile in the city of, of New York. <laughs> and then magnetic force field, boom, catch the missile. Dump it in Hudson Bay, the river. <sighs> Collapse and exhaustion, music swells. Woo! Hero, right? That, that's what happens here. This is not superhero Jesus. This isn't, hey, Peter, throw your nuts on the other side of the boat. collapsing on the Galilean seashore. woo That was awesome! Not superhero Jesus. This is Jesus going, hey Peter, why don't you toss your nets on the other side of the boat? And then with a thought, all the fish in the lake go, whoa, get in the net. <laughs> That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. 
not straining, not sweating, just being God. And all of creation is like, bow down. That's Jesus. Which means it's not a wrong instinct to repent when standing before him. But it's not a groveling repentance, is it, Jason? Because what Jesus says isn't, dang straight, you dirty earthworm fish farmer. <laughs> Bow down. You stay down there. I'll come back when I'm ready for you. Jesus says, hey, no, no, no. You're with me. Let's go. That's the holy tension of being in the presence of a holy God in whose presence we should be incinerated and yet he draws us into himself which means as a follower of Jesus it's not just groveling act of repentance every week because we're trying to you know okay and then forgive me for that and oh yeah there was that and oh God forgive me for that like you know check the box off the list it's a lifestyle of repenting for the whole of not being worthy and being loved anyways I mean how does Tim Keller put it the gospel is that in Christ you know, we're more loved, or, or, or how does he say it? The gospel is realizing that, that, that we're more sinful than we could wildly imagine and more loved than we could wildly comprehend. Like that's the gospel, right? And that's what Peter's experiencing here. So a follower of Jesus is listening to Jesus. He's trusting Jesus. He's repenting regularly of Jesus, to Jesus. And the next, a follower of Jesus is leaving the lesser. He's leaving the lesser for Jesus. Look at the text. Jesus says, uh, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for men. So they pulled their boats to the shore, left everything, and followed him. Here's the point. You can't keep your old life and keep up with Jesus. Jesus. Think of how ridiculous it would have been if Jesus would have tried to follow Jesus, or if Peter, excuse me, would have tried to follow Jesus with his boat. <laughs> I'll be right there. I'm coming. Who built this dang boat? Go for it. I'm okay. Give me a second here. Following Jesus is hard. Yeah, you're making it hard, moron. Leave the boat, dude. Bail the nets, man. Just, just, just. Follow Jesus. Question, are you freely following Jesus? Or are you dragging your boat? Because you think it's, in case the Jesus thing doesn't work out, you'll have your boat. Newsflash, if Jesus doesn't work out and you have your boat four miles from the lake, it won't help anyways. And here's the misnomer that I want this story to correct as you look at Peter as a prototypical disciple of Jesus is that oftentimes I think we have pity for Peter. Like, man, that guy gave up a lot. What do you mean? Well, he left, he left like everything, bro. I mean, like boat and nets and security and job and career and retirement and stuff and materials and, and everything that was represented in that boat, reputation, future, retirement. He left all of that to follow Jesus, man, that, that is, that, that's faith right there. That is faith. Go, Peter. Go, Peter. Glad he's on our team. I don't want to do that. Because the implicit assumption is leaving everything to follow Jesus is a sacrifice. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you've been asked by the maker of the stars to leave a dirty, smelly boat to follow him, you may be leaving your everything, but newsflash, friend, you are in exchange gaining everything. Which is why following Jesus should not be marked by this sense of self-pity, sacrificial, look what I gave up, but kind of a grateful, dumbstruck wonder and awe. I can't believe I get to follow Jesus. This is crazy. We feel pity for Peter because he left everything, followed Jesus, came back to the boat later, got reinstated, and commissioned to preach the gospel, and then preached the gospel and got persecuted. And then he got imprisoned. 
and then he was martyred. And we're like, man, that, that's a tough gig. <laughs> Getting killed for your faith? And it wasn't against his will. He had a choice. Hey, just quit preaching the gospel, Peter, and you can go free. Stop talking about Jesus. Fish all you want. Shut down the whole church planting thing. There's your boat. Peter's like, yeah, you know, here's a problem. It wasn't just any man that came along the water and called me to follow him that day. You see, it was, uh, it was actually the Lord of the fish. And uh, until I find somebody who's better, I, I, I'm staying. And so you can kill me if you want, that's okay, but if you don't, I'm gonna keep talking about Jesus. And so they killed him. They said, we're gonna crucify you. He said, okay, I get it, but real quick, could you do it upside down? Because see, the Lord of the fish was crucified up, right, right side up, and I'm not worthy to die in the way that my Savior, okay, you got it, upside down, boom, nailed him to the cross alongside his wife. And we all sit here in our kind of comfortable, westernized, air-conditioned room, not knocking that, just kind of where we're at, and go, man, that's dedication. I'm hoping we could come, like, ratchet it back three notches and find a, a, a discipleship level there that we're all okay with. But it's because we're missing the point, friends. Peter didn't die going, dang it, I knew I should have stayed with the boat. Peter died going into your hands, Father, I kept my spirit. I'm coming. I'm coming for my reward. Because, friends, there are rewards in Jesus you simply can't gain or earn or obtain apart from Jesus in this life, hard as though you may try. And so part of this discipleship thing is getting right in our head who we should be following, whose word we should be listening to, whose vision we should be pursuing. God's vision, our vision. Because here's the thing. You say, you know, Peter died for the sake of following Jesus. And I think Peter died more alive than many any of us have ever experienced in this room. You say, why is that? I say, because you think Peter would have ever died for his fishing boat? No. Do you think Peter would have ever died for his fishing nets? No. Okay. So then in, in Jesus coming and giving Peter something worth dying for, Peter didn't lose anything. Peter gained everything because if you have yet to find something or more clearly someone to die for, friend, you have not yet begun to live. And so let's just be done with the whole sacrificially following Jesus garbage and start talking about the wonder and awe and privilege of getting to lay down everything to follow him who will give us back everything in the end anyways. Followers of Jesus listening to Jesus. They're trusting Jesus. They're repenting to Jesus. They're leaving the lesser things to follow Jesus. And lastly, a follower of Jesus is someone who's fishing for men. What I skipped over here, I'll just say briefly. Leaving everything is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing. I mean, interesting to note, when Peter left his, his, the fishing boats and the nets, it wasn't if he got on a plane, flew to Zimbabwe, never to see them again. They, they, they walked around in a pretty small area. My guess, he, he walked by his boats a few more times. I'll be right there, Jesus. Yeah, 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 coming, coming. <laughs> he had multiple opportunities to, to go back to the boat, to go back to the job, to go back to the life. I Meaning he had to repeatedly leave everything to follow Jesus. It's not a one time, I've left everything, I'm good, now I'm in, whew, safe, I pay, pay, pay at the office. It's a moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, consciously listening, trusting, repenting, and then leaving that which is tempting you to stay with the boat. And, and if the question becomes, does that mean to follow Jesus, I need to leave my job? Well, of course not. Well then, Josh, what's the point? And I think this is the point. That the call to follow Jesus takes on a priority that says, I am prepared to do whatever God would call me to do. 
For some of you, you shouldn't leave your job. I'm going to step back. Maybe for all of you, or for most of you, don't leave your job. That's, that, that's your fishing ground. But what it says is, my posture has changed. So that it's all on the table. Give, take away, it's up to you, Lord. Lastly, a follower of Jesus is fishing for men. Look what Jesus says. Don't be afraid, Simon Peter. From now on, you will fish for people. When Peter obeyed Jesus and he put his nets into the boat, out of the water, that was the last time he would ever toss his nets out as a mere fisher of fish. In listening, trusting, repenting, following, right? Now he is, in leaving, he is now become something and someone different. I mean, when you chose to follow Jesus, the last time, that's the last time you're just a dentist or you're just a nurse or you're just a coach or you're just a, an attorney or you're just a fill in the blank, small business owner. You are now follower of Jesus, fisher of men. Because this call to Peter, while he did live an exceptional life as a disciple, it is not an exceptional example of a disciple. It is the prototypical work that God does with every one of us, calling us to himself, to follow him. Pretty cool to think about this picture of the miracle of the fish being a prophetic picture or a prophetic metaphor of what would happen to come, both in Peter's life and in your, my life as the church. Meaning, Peter listens to Jesus, obeys him, does a simple act of faith, and boom, God fills the boat with fish. And about three and a half years later, Jesus was crucified, buried, rose on the third day, conquered death, commissioned the disciples to go into the world making disciples, ascended to heaven, sent his Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and in Acts chapter two, this blue collar, backwater fisherman. This would be the equivalent of God calling like a farmer or a construction worker in our time. You know what I mean? It's like that's kind of like, you know, big, 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 big sources of economy here in our town, farming, construction. This, this is just, this is a farmer. And in Acts chapter two, blue collar, backwater, no public speaking experience. Peter stands up and under the power of the Spirit stumbles his way through his first sermon. No funny analogies, no gripping illustrations, just preaching the truth that he had been taught by Jesus and at the end, crowds of people say, what must we do to be saved? And all Peter does is says, repent, believe, and be baptized. Boom, 3,000 people are saved that day. I'd never connected the dots before. Jesus was giving Peter a prophetic metaphor of what would happen when he obeyed him in the mission of God to fish for men. Peter, just toss the nets outside the boat, buddy, and I'll fill up the nets. Peter, just answer their question. How must we be saved? Repent, believe, be baptized. Boom, full to the gunwales, boat sinking. And I've been praying that as we're living together in faith and learning to live on mission together and become fishers of men together, both individually and corporately, that in the small actual obedience, God will find great delight to fill up our boat so that we think it's gonna sink. Look how many people got baptized. This is great. This is terrifying. This is exciting. What are we gonna do? Woo! So how is the mission of the church like fishing? This isn't just Peter's call. This was, this was Jesus explaining the mission of the church that you and I are a part of. So what is in this prophetic metaphor that we can learn about the mission of the church? Number one, it takes careful planning. You don't fish without planning. You gotta, you, you gotta get the boat, you gotta get the nets, you gotta prepare the nets, you gotta think about where you're gonna go, you gotta take food if you're gonna be out there longer. You have to carefully plan your strategy if you're going to be successful. You can't just walk out there and wing it. It takes hard work. This wasn't like a guy, you know, in bare feet, huck fin, you know, bamboo fishing pole out in the water. Ooh, I got one, you know. This was commercial fishing, big boats, heavy boats, stinky boats, got to be clean, huge nets, long nets, heavy nets, fished all night, exhausted, putting these things out, pulling them back in, putting it out, pulling back in, putting it back out, pulling back in, empty every time. It's discouraging, it's tiring, it's hard. They come in, now they gotta spread the nets out so they dry. If they don't, if they don't dry, they'll, 
They'll shrink, they'll tear, tear, they'll rot, and they're getting it all done, and Jesus is like, hey, why don't you go out and throw the nets out again? You're like, really? Folks, the mission of God will not always be easy. It'll be hard. It'll take work, it'll take sweat, it'll take labor, it'll take some sore muscles. It takes teamwork. I love this picture. This wasn't, this wasn't one guy in a fishing pole. This was a team of people in multiple boats, casting out multiple nets, hauling in a harvest of fish that none of them could do on their own. Isn't that a great picture of how the church works? How many people in this room think they, they got what it takes to complete the Great Commission in Wenatchee and to the ends of the earth? Nobody? As soon as the fish came, hey, we're sinking over here, come on and help. And this is what I love about the church. God's call to us is a corporate call to be fishers of men, but he issues it individually to each person here. To Linnea, to Matt, to Dawn. He says, join the team, join the family, be a part of something bigger than you could do on your own. But I'm talking to you individually, Jeffrey. Are you in or are you out? Jesus didn't say, hey, y'all, go out and cast your nets. He said, Peter, push the boat out and put it in your side of the net. It was an individual call that as an act of obedience in Peter's faith caused multiple people to experience the harvest. It takes casting a wide net. You don't just toss it over, you gotta you got put it out. We gotta preach, we gotta grow, we gotta invite, we gotta pray, we gotta have people in our home, we gotta be in their home. We, we gotta cast a wide net. I'm, I'm, I'm always shocked at folks that get saved. I'm, I'm like, I could see that person, but that person, are you kidding me? Because here's what's also true. You never know what you're gonna get. You don't. That's not up to us. We cast the net, God does the drawing. How about this, it takes equipment and gear. I love it, Jesus didn't say, hey walk on water Peter, cast an invisible net and watch my miracle. He said take the boat that you mortgaged and that you worked to pay off and take the nets that you built and that you sewed by yourself and take those out and do some fishing with them. Whatever you catch requires cleaning. <laughs> you know I'm right, just look at yourself. <laughs> right Jess? Whatever we catch requires cleaning, and guess what? We're still being cleaned. <laughs> Which means there ain't no fish so stinky that God couldn't catch and clean. And lastly, maybe most importantly, in this prof prophetic metaphor and analogy for the mission of the church, it's really less about your fishing strategy, and it's more about your fishing partner. You could employ all the strategies you want as an expert in fishing and still not catch a fish. You could have Jesus say, toss your net out into deep water in the middle of the day and catch a lifetime load of fish because it's not always about our strategy so much as it is about our partner. Which means what we're doing with building home and giving money and making plans and dreaming dreams and, and building this thing, if we build it and stand out there and go, woohoo, and God doesn't show up and fill the nets, we have wasted our time. But it'll take work, and it'll take sacrifice, and it'll take effort. And somewhere in the mystery of our work and our effort and our labor and God's providential sovereign hand, when those things come together, fill up the boats and the boats sink. Lifetime catch. So having said that, we made a little progress on our new home this week. You want to see it? Okay, be honest, so I'm not totally disappointed. How many of you actually drove by and saw what happened this week? You sneaky pants. A bunch of you, that's right. Here was the job site when nothing had been done. There was one of the tractors that got sh shown up, front end loader, whatever they call those things. Job trailers. There's Pete being philosophical about the footings we were getting ready to pour. Oh, there's some footings going up. There's some rebar going in. There's some more rebar going in. There is the concrete going into the foundation, the footing for the elevator. There is a small mountain of concrete poured in some forms. There is more concrete being poured, 410 yards of concrete to be exact. There's Smith Excavation changing God's world, moving dirt, preparing for the chapel. 
There is the west parking lot where hopefully God's going to bring some fish. There's more of Greg's toys out there on the ground. Here's a beam so heavy they couldn't lift, so they called our staff to come out and help move it. Kyle pulled his back. I carried most of the load. Pretty obvious there what happened. <laughs> kidding. You want to see where it's at today? <laughs> Woo! Oh, man! Oh, man! Woo! Oh, come on! That's our home. That's our new home. Oh, man. I finally feel like I can relate to women in childbirth. I can't? <laughs> no? <laughs> I think I just lost half the crowd there, Adam. <laughs> Four years of burning labor, and I walked out and saw those things, I was like, let's do it again. That was awesome. Right? Twelve hours of screaming bloody murder, holding that slimy little thing. Honey, let's have another one. That's how I felt. I was like, oh, I get it where she's coming from now. <gasps> Woo! Make no mistake, friends. We're building a boat and some nets to go fishing. But let's not think that in building the boats and the nets, we're going to catch any fish. If Jesus doesn't show up, then we have just exercised time and spent some money, and that's about it. But here's what I love about the story of Peter and the fish. Jesus is saying, if you're listening to me, if you're trusting me, if you're repenting to me, if you're leaving stuff for me, if you're following me, if you're fishing for men in my name, here's the promise of Luke 5. You will catch fish. <laughs> it's not a risk. It's not an unknown. It's not a rolling of the dice. You listen to Jesus. You push the boats out. You throw the net over the shore, over the boat, and buckle up. The fish are coming. Make no mistakes, friends. This has been nothing short of an act of faithful obedience on behalf of God's people. And I believe when God gave me the word prepare for this year, he gave it not just to me but to us, that he's calling us to prepare for the harvest of fish he's coming, he's bringing, because he's Lord of the fish, and he loves catching fish, and he's the one who brings the fish in, but for some reason he's asked us to be a part of it. And so in, in obedience to him, we're like, okay, don't get it, doesn't make sense, not impossible, it's doable, here we go, and let's see what happens. So here's what I want to do. I want to ask if the people serving communion will come on down. You guys can come on down and start serving communion to us while I'm talking, and you can pass it as I'm explaining. I want to explain to you why we do communion. And if you are new to Christianity, hopefully this will be helpful. If you've been following Jesus for a long time, hopefully this will be encouraging and affirming. Communion is where we take bread and we take juice and we take it into our body commemorating the body of Jesus that was broken and the blood of Jesus that was shed. And we take it into us because in Jesus' life we have found life. It's Christ in you that's the hope of glory, Paul said. So it's the metaphor of Christ's broken body and his lifeless body is now in me and then when he came to life, I've come to life and in participating with Christ's death, I can participate in his resurrection. It's symbolic. It's not ritualistic weirdoism. It's a simple physical reminder of a spiritual reality that the broken body of Christ and the shed blood of Jesus has absorbed the wrath of God that we might be set free from our sins. But here's what I want you to see this morning specifically. This story in Luke 5 is not a standalone story. It's actually a bookended story. And I am embarrassed to even say that I had never connected the dots until this week looking at the story. And I'm reading the story of Jesus with Peter and the boat and the nets and fish on the shore. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, did, did this happen somewhere? John 21. And I go to John 21, and in John 21, there is the exact same story. Did you know that? But it's not the same story. You got to flash forward three or four years. Jesus has been crucified. He's dead. He's risen from the grave. 
And Peter, who had been following Jesus for three and a half years, abandoned Jesus and betrayed Jesus in the moment when, his, when Jesus actually needed him, he wilts in the face of a little girl who says, hey, aren't you with that guy who's on trial right now and going to be crucified? And Peter says, hey, not me, not me. And he does that three times. He denies Jesus. After following Jesus for three years, Jesus is crucified. Peter runs away in shame. I've blown it. I've messed up. I've failed. I abandoned Jesus when he needed me most. He's like, I just got to clear my head, and he goes fishing. And while fishing, out on the water, the text says, and you got to read John 21 today. The text says, and they had fished all night and not caught a thing. Ring any bells? And then they saw a man on the shore, and the man said, hey, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. Ring any bells? And it says that they did, and as soon as they did, their nets were filled overflowing so much that their nets began to tear and their boat began to sink. Ring any bells? And in that moment of revelation, Peter goes, hey, that's Jesus! And here's what's crazy. In Luke 5, before Peter had done any, any bad things in, in front of Jesus, betraying him, leaving him, failing him, when he saw Jesus as God, holy, other, Lord of the fish, the sense of, of sin was like, I, I, I need to get away from here. You probably won't want to be around me anyways. Why don't you go that way? I'll go this way. I'm just going to run over here and hide. And then flash forward after three years, Peter knew Jesus, and he understood the gospel, and then he failed Jesus, and then he sees Jesus, and what does the text says that he does? It says, picking up his garments and wrapping them around his body, he jumped into the water, and he swam until he could touch, and then he ran until he was free, and he ran to Jesus, not away from him. What's the difference between Luke 5 Peter and John 21 Peter? Here's the difference. Peter understood in both scenarios that he was a sinner, but only in the second that Jesus was his only hope to be saved. He realized, where else could I go? I have royally screwed up. There's only one place I gotta be. It's at his feet. You see, the religious response says, I'm a sinner, so I'm gonna go hide. The relationship response to seeing Jesus says, I'm a sinner, where else could I go? And so here's the question, friend. Here's how you know if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Which way do you run when you've really blown it? Do you avoid church? Don't want to see my friends right now? Make some excuses, skip city group, just kind of get some space between me and that big mistake and I'll ease my way back in? That's not a relationship with Jesus. That's managing a religious facade. But the more you know Jesus, the quicker you want to be with him, the moment you've blown it, ah, where could I go? Jesus. And so that's what communion is, friends. Here's the question I want to ask, and I want an honest response by a show of hands. How many this week, this week, have in some small way or some large way or in any way blown it by a show of hands and hold them high? Because I'm just going to make sure every hands are raised. Okay, good. Where should we run, church? Don't run away. <laughs> run to Jesus. Don't avoid the Savior. Run to the Savior. Don't walk away from the life giver. Run toward the life giver. Are you Luke 5, Peter? Or are you a John 21, Peter? What does it mean to follow Jesus, Josh? Well, it means you gotta listen to Jesus. So his voice, right? You gotta, you gotta look to him and trust him. Ongoing act of repentance in life. Leaving what you could have for what only he could give. Already in your life, increasingly around fishing for men individually and helping the corporate family fish more effectively. And then when you blow it, you're running toward him, not away from him. That's the essence of following him.
Will you get it right? Nope. Will you blow it? Yep. Will you need help? Absolutely. That's why we do it together. And so church, I want to invite you to stand. And with this communion in our hands, I want us to together run to Jesus.